Hello, my name is Eric Wiseman. I'm an Associate Professor of Urban and Community Forestry in the Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation at Virginia Tech. And today I'm here to talk to you about tree anatomy and physiology. Today we're in Eureka Park here in Roanoke City, and I'm standing in front of a semi-mature pin oak, Quercus palustris. Let me tell you a little bit about the basic anatomy of the tree. So if we look at the three major parts of the tree, we have the crown, the trunk and the root system. Beginning with the crown, it is composed of the major structural branches in the tree known as the scaffold branches. Those scaffold branches support the twigs, which are the terminal portions of the branches, and those twigs support the foliage. That foliage collectively makes up the canopy of the tree. Below the crown of the tree is the trunk. That is, of course, where all of the branches converge and head towards the ground and join up with the root system of the tree. The trunk transitions into the root system at ground line. The first major part of the root system that we observe is known as the root collar. This is where you'll see the upper portions of the buttress roots, which are the major structural roots of the root system. And then from there, the root system transitions below ground. As we spread out further from the base of the tree, we'll see various forms of structural roots. And then eventually, those roots will taper down and form into the absorptive root system. The root system as a whole is relatively shallow and extensive. Typically, most of your roots are going to be within three feet of the soil level, with most of your absorbing roots being much more shallow than that, typically between one half and one foot in depth. In terms of the extent of the root system, it can be quite variable depending on the species and the growing environment, but a good rule of thumb is that the root system will spread out as wide as the drip line of the tree and maybe up to twice that distance. Let's talk about functions of the root system. There are four main functions. The first being absorption. That's absorbing water and essential elements from the soil. We then have translocation. That's moving those materials towards the base of the tree. Of course, the anchorage function is really important for keeping the tree secured in the soil. And then finally, the storage function, the tree moving carbohydrates for storage in the major roots for later use for energy. Here I am with this open grown pin oak, and this is a good opportunity to talk about how far the root system spreads out. I'm standing at the edge of the canopy. This is known as the drip zone. And with many species of trees, this is a good determinant of how wide the root system will spread. Within this area from the edge of the drip line to the base of the tree is where we'll find the majority of the root system. And typically it will be spread out more or less symmetrically around the entire perimeter of the trunk of the tree under the drip line. Here on this pinnock, we have a great example of trunk flare and the root collar. The trunk flare is where we see the tapering out of the base of the trunk due to the development of reaction wood as the tree grows older. And then at the base of the trunk flare, we have the root collar. The root collar comprises buttress roots that spread out around the perimeter of the trunk like spokes on a wagon wheel. These form the basis for the structural root system to which the absorptive root system is attached. So growth habit or form of the tree is the shape that a tree takes on based on the length and orientation of the branches that make up the crown. The interesting thing about growth habit is that it's influenced by the genetics of the tree, its growing environment, and even its age. As trees grow older, their growth habit will often change. As we can see in this young swamp white oak, Quercus bicolor, it's a good example of the excurrent growth habit that is very typical of young oak trees. It has a dominant central leader and subordinate scaffold branches. But as this tree grows older, its crown will begin to take on a more rounded habit. There are two main growth habits of trees that we commonly observe, excurrent and decurrent. Excurrent trees are those that have a dominant central leader whereas decurrent trees have multiple leaders and take on a more rounded growth habit. Oftentimes this growth habit is impacted by the growing environment that we see the tree in. In open grown environments where there's an abundance of space and shade, even excurrent trees will sometimes take on more of a co-dominant leader decurrent growth habit. A good example of that is what we see here with this young Schumard oak that has developed co-dominant leaders. Although this is a natural occurrence, it can be undesirable for trees growing in urban areas 
because this can become a defect in the tree. As we look at this tree, we can see the bark inclusion that has developed as these two stems have gotten larger in diameter relative to one another. This included or embedded bark can be a place of weak branch attachment and eventually decay and cracking, leading to one or the other of the leaders breaking out, possibly causing property damage and definitely jeopardizing the health of the tree. A process in trees that influences their growth habit is known as apical dominance. This is the influence that the apex of the tree exerts upon the lower branches in the crown. This is a hormonal relationship primarily uh, cued by auxin. Auxin flowing down from the terminal buds suppresses the growth of lateral branches lower in the crown, maintaining dominance of the central leader. Over time, this apical dominance will tend to wane in trees as they reach their middle age. As we can see in this pin oak, it's beginning to take on more of a rounded form because the dominant central leader is beginning to lose some of that control. Over time, that apical dominance will continue to taper off up until the point that we have mature trees, like this white oak, where we begin to see almost complete loss of apical dominance, and the crown takes on a flat-topped appearance. And in this case, we have multiple leaders that have grown to more or less equal height than the tree. And this is typical of many open-grown uh, trees, regardless of whether they're excurrent or decurrent. Another important aspect of tree form is the mature stature or size of the tree. We typically refer to trees as being understory, midstory, or overstory trees to indicate how tall and broad their crowns achieve at maturity. Understory trees, many of which are common ornamentals, such as this red bud, Circus canadensis, will achieve a mature height of 25 feet or smaller. Whereas our shade trees, such as our oaks and elms, tend to be overstory species that attain much greater heights and spreads. Knowing how large a tree will ultimately mature is a really important consideration when we're selecting trees to plant in urban areas. Conifers are known for having a very strong excurrent growth habit in most of the species. Interestingly, conifers also tend to maintain very strong apical dominance into maturity and therefore will maintain that excurrent growth habit very strongly. A great example of that is what we see here with this Norway spruce, Picea abies, a mature specimen that has maintained a nice excurrent form well into maturity. Sometimes genetic mutations occur in trees naturally that give rise to very odd growth habits or forms. You might get very odd proportions in the height or the crown spread or even the branch orientation. Oftentimes these, these genetic abnormalities result in desirable growth habits for trees that people want to have in the landscape. A good example of that are fastidiate cultivars of trees. A cultivar is a cultivated variety of a species that has a unique genotype that has a blueprint that provides a very unique growth habit, like we see in this cultivar of a sugar maple, Acer saccharum. The primary branches that make up the crown of the tree are called scaffold branches. They're called scaffold branches because they play an important role in forming the structure of the crown. They support lateral branches, and those lateral branches then support twigs and then the buds and foliage at the very ends of those branches. Here we have the stem of a young northern red oak, Quercus rubra. This is a great example of a branch attachment of a lateral branch. So some key features that make up the branch attachment. First of all, we have the parent stem and the lateral branch. And then there's three features that we want to look at here. One is the branch bark ridge which is this raised portion between the lateral branch and the parent stem. We then have the branch collar, which is a swollen area beneath the branch attachment. And then third, we collectively refer to that as the branch union or branch crotch. Here we have a twig from this pin oak, and it shows some of the key features. Of course, the twig is the most terminal portion of a branch that developed during the preceding growing season. And some of the things that I'm seeing while I look at this twig include the lenticels, which are those openings in the bark that allow gas exchange. I see the leaf scars from where leaves have abscised from the twig. 
I see the lateral and terminal buds. These are the growing points for the next growing season where new shoots and leaves will emerge. And then we have the leaves themselves. We have the leaf blade, we have the petiole, and within that leaf, of course, we have the veins that uh, carry water and essential elements out to the foliage and then move carbohydrates back from the foliage into the twig.